hello welcome back to the godly life video station video channel youtube whatever and thanks for listening in and today this video is mind-blowing mind-blowing indeed um i saw this i saw two video i listened to two videos and i heard what was said and god revealed somehow in my thick head wow and i was able to put two and two together about um the mark of the beast and the mark of Cain and how we all have it or we all have had it. You know, it depends, but we all willingly took it in ignorance at some point in our life. We all 100% took it at some point in our life. And I'm going to prove that to you today. Uh, we're going to watch a video um, from a rabbi explaining to you what the word Cain and Cain means and it's just going to blow your mind, open up your eyes, and you're not going to, you'll never be able to, to understand this any different way. I mean, maybe you might not get it totally, that's okay, but then after that, I'm going to play a video sermon of the, the flesh. It's not specifically talking about the mark of the beast or the mark of Cain, but you will see they are one and the same, and you'll see how we took it unknowingly, um, that's why Jesus can forgive us and say, Father, forgive them. They know what, not what they do. What they do, they do in ignorance. And that, um, um, well, let's just go on. All right, I'm going to start at the beginning um, in Genesis 4, 5. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be on him sevenfold. And the Lord sent a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Now remember, of course, later on, one of the Ten Commandments was thou shalt not kill, right? But in here, Strong's, uh, the word for um, a sign was put on Cain was Strong's H226, which is the word oath, oath, which means a signal, literally or figuratively, right? Now we're reading this in the spirit, so it's going to be figuratively, as a flag, a beacon, a monument, an ottoman, a prodigy evidence, a, a sign, a token. Now you have to remember Jesus' words when you hear that, by their fruits you shall know them. But don't get all uppity and thinking that, oh yes, us them, us them. No, that's not the way it is. So let's continue. Uh, we'll read Revelation thirteen eleven through 17. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but spoke like a dragon, exercised all the authority of the first beast, on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed and it performed great signs and even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people now perhaps you can imagine maybe a rocket or something like that with the fire coming down from the air and everybody watching it on cable tv you see that now it's quite common and it's talking about the power of the mind here not a person or a specific group of people. It's talking about mankind. Because the signs, it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth, right? The prince of the power of the air is your mind. It ordered them to set up an image in honor to, in, to honor of the beast who was wounded. And we all think we got great minds, right? Doesn't um, The ex-president said he was a, has an excellent mind who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast. In other words, it gave it animation so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. Spiritually, of course, right? What did Cain do to Abel? He killed him. What did the world do to Jesus? He killed him. Think of all the prophets. Every, anyone that had the spirit of God and displayed it and was living in it and manifested it in their being to show that they were holy people pretty much without uh without fault they were killed people killed you know they were killed in some which way or another it also forced people great and small rich and poor free and slave to receive a mark on their right hands in other words everybody received the right hands on uh, on their foreheads which is your thoughts so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark which is the name of the beast and the number of its name, which of course is six exists, which is the number of mankind. 
Because it's not the number of a man. It's the number of mankind. You could look that up. And, of course, Mark, um, the mark here is Strong's uh, 5480 and Strong's, and it's a badge of servitude. Badge of servitude. In other words, you know, he's my boy. In Ezekiel 28.16, we read, By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned, and therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy the oak, oak covering cherub from the midst of the stones of fire. Now, what is this merchandising here? What is this? Oh, he's talking about the devil, John. You're talking about something totally different. No, I'm not. And you'll see, when you hear the rabbi talk about the name of Cain, you'll understand where mankind went wrong. Because you got to remember, you can't take the, 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 the things in the Bible, while they may have happened for real, they're, they're spiritual, spiritually discerned words, right? God says you must worship me in spirit and truth, not in the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. So don't look at the letter. Ignore the letter. See beyond the letter into the spirit. Now here he's saying, you know, merchandise. The merchandise here is strong. <clears throat> H7404, which means merchandise trade or traffic. Buying and selling, now I want you to remember this, buying and selling is what? It's an exchange, right? When you buy and sell, you're making an exchange. It's an act of giving one thing and receiving another, especially sometimes of the same kind of return. So I give you money, you give me a radio, right? Um, I paint your house, you give me pie, whatever the, whatever the case might be but it's an exchange of something. So buying and selling is not just, oh, I can't go buy food for my kids. It means I won't be, I, I, I'm not exchanging. I'm not working in that mentality of an exchange. And here's what I mean by that. In the mentality of an exchange, this is today's Christian, today's Muslim, today's Buddhist, etc., and today's religions, even if they're an atheist. They believe they live in the world of two powers, give and get bad and good, evil and whatever. So they say, if I perform X, I will get Y. So a Christian might say, if I fast, God will give me X. Or if I get baptized in water, God will give me Y. Or if I pray for X, God will give me Y. If I meditate, maybe the New Agers will say, I will get Y from God or spirit or universe, whatever it is that they believe, right? Or the Muslims might believe, if I fast, I get why? If I do more good works than bad good works, I get why. You see, there's always an exchange. They treat God like a genie, like a, like a, like a, uh, like a merchant. People treat God like a merchant. And you know what Jesus did to the merchants inside the temple. And the temple, don't forget, is your body, your mind. And of course, we know Jesus told us to, to, uh, to give and expect nothing in return. Don't obsess over our wants and needs or even give them a thought. Yet that's what we do. We pray for things. We pray for people. We expect, um, we, we live in the consciousness and in the world of give and get. Exchange, merchandise, buy and sell. So if, if you have that mark, if you have that belief system within you, if you have the mark of the beast, the mark of Cain, which is the mark of the carnal man, you can buy and sell. You will live in the world of buy and sell. That will be your belief system. However, those who do not, like Abel, who do not believe in that system and believe in relying on God for everything, there is no interchange. There is no buy and sell. They do good without expecting anything in return. Well, guess what? They get killed by the brother who's buying and selling. They get thrown out of the churches. They get thrown out of the synagogues. And I'm not just talking about doctrines. You know, oh, we got thrown out of, out of XY church because we don't believe in Trinity. No, that's not it. That's, that's, that's baloney. That's just, that's just petty, petty nonsense. I'm talking about when someone, when, when the light comes into the world, People preferred the darkness rather than the light. So when the light said, I come into the world, I will be your footsteps. I will do all for you. I will follow you even in the grave. I will be your God. You are uh, God's children. God is my father and your father. Call no man on earth your father, 
there is only one father except God, and then we go around preaching born in sin. You see? That's the way it works, my friends. Now, I'm going to show you two videos. I'll put them back to back. One is of the rabbi talking about um, Cain, and then the next video will be um, another video talking about um, basically, you know, how we've all done that and how uh, this world operates and how we can crucify our flesh and come out of this world. So I hope you love this video because I, <laughs> I'm not talking about my videos. I hope you love the message. I'm sorry. I hope you love the message and I hope it gives you a big blessing. Seriously. And I thank you for coming in and, um, Hey, I am a rabbi. And, um, so, um, right. So what, what Cain did was perfectly logical and perfectly normal. And for those people who are Bible enthusiasts, it's worthwhile to actually go back and look at the verses and discover that um, there's a sort of incomplete sentence there where it says, uh, and Cain said to, uh, to Abel in the field, you know, they were talking, but it doesn't tell us what they were talking about. And again, ancient Jewish wisdom drawing on the um, subtext uh, encrypted into the Hebrew characters uh, points out that uh, it was obvious what they were talking about, and the Bible never tells you things that are obvious. What they were talking about was Cain said to Abel, um, you know, Father Adam is getting old, and uh, we, you and I are his only offspring. We have to decide who inherits the world. And um, Cain said, so here's what I've decided. Uh, you can have the spiritual reality. I'll take the physical reality. And if you want to live on anywhere, on any land, you just have to pay me rent, and, um, and that's how it'll work. And Abel said, you know, absolutely not. That's out of the question. Um, as a matter of fact, we are going to share equally. I'm going to take half the land. You're going to take the, half the land. And what's more, I'm getting British Columbia. Uh, uh, that part I just put in myself. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, I love British Columbia. Um, <laughs> Love but uh, Cain then, and, and one of the things we have to know is that Cain's name in Hebrew, in Hebrew, every name has a meaning. There are no names in Hebrew like Fred or Agatha. Uh, every name has a meaning. And Cain's name means I live to acquire stuff. Interesting. You know, so he sees reality in tangible physical Sometimes things. An argument arises because <clears throat> some very miraculous things have been done with the power of the mind or the power of thought. In the three-dimensional world, mind is not only a great power, it probably is a greater power than all the matter that ever could be assembled together. Mind can be used for constructively helping oneself and others and mind can be used to destroy others and the entire world and in the end destroy oneself with it it was the utilization of mind through a propaganda bureau that brought the united states into world war one after it had elected a president on the promise that he had kept us out of war a few months later he took them into war through a propaganda bureau that operated on people's minds and within a few months had them shouting let us get at them let us go to war all hypnotism all propaganda all mind being influenced three nights before the president was elected for his third term, he said to the public on radio, if I am re-elected, your sons will never set foot on foreign soil in war. And a few months later, they were all on foreign soil in war. How do people get changed that way? Of their own accord, do they do that? No, they are worked on mentally. 
there is a power in the human mind. A couple of years ago, a form of advertising was discovered in which you could sell any product you wanted without letting the purchaser know that you were advertising it to him. In other words, you could make him go in and buy it even if he couldn't afford it, even if he didn't want it. Well, that was soon stopped because there was a higher power than mind about which they didn't know at the time. But on the three-dimensional level, the mind is very powerful. And if you or anyone were to persistently hold on to good thoughts and right thoughts and loving thoughts and charitable thoughts, uh, you'd make some measure of progress in that direction in altering your nature and character. And on the other hand, if you just lent your mind to uh, the obscene, the destructive, the carnal, there isn't any question about it that in a few months you tend to become that way and look like that too. Because whatever you are in your mind begins to show forth in your face. And so it is that on the third dimension, in the third dimension of life, which is mind and matter, you can make quite a power out of the mind and you can choose you can make it for good and you can make it for evil because the mind is not a power but an instrument and it is the individual who is using the mind and is using the mind for good or evil through good thoughts or bad thoughts, constructive thoughts or destructive thoughts. So it is never the mind that is power. It is the individual on the human level of life who still can choose whether he will be good or evil and whether he will use it for good or evil or even if he's using it for good, if he'll be sure that he's using it for impersonal good, not just for my good, which may be at your expense. Now, I bring this out to you for this reason. Once you have chosen the mystical path, the spiritual path, you can no longer be either good nor evil. You then have no powers to be good or evil because when you meditate and you make contact with the spirit within, it performeth that which is given you to do. It lives your life, and it is neither good nor evil. It is just spiritual and perfect and infinite. There is no such thing as good and evil in spirit. There is no such thing as rich or poor in spirit. There's infinity. There's no such thing as health or sickness. There's immortality. So therefore, when you are not living by bread alone or exercise or diet, when you are not living just from money alone or property or investments, but when you are living by the word of God that you contact in your meditation, you are no longer living according to your will to be good or your will to be charitable, or your will to be moral. This is no longer your choice. This no longer lies within your power. Now it is that every time that you go within, since the kingdom of God is closer to you than breathing, every time you go within and feel a release in there, the Spirit is performing the functions of your life and whatever function you have will be done infinitely good 
and it will be done eternally, not just for today or tomorrow and torn down next week or next month by a depression or a boom or a war. In other words, the evils of this world will not come nigh your dwelling place because it won't any longer be you dwelling. It'll be the Father within doing the dwelling. Now, it is for this reason I make this a complete lesson so that you will see that there are temporal powers the germ theory or the hereditary theory or bombs or bullets these are all temporal powers and there are temporal powers of the mind but in the presence of this which is released when you touch the center of your being these are not power neither matter nor mind can function in any injurious way in your experience matter and mind both become servants and tools never destructive and therefore if we have a material body it becomes our instrument to be governed and controlled by the spirit within me and since I have a mind and it's always thinking then it isn't I thinking it is the spirit thinking and those thoughts then are spiritual and eternal and therefore both mind thoughts and body all of these mind thoughts and body become instruments for the spirit and my mind has to become a blessing to this world and all who come within range of me my thoughts must be a blessing to all who come within range of me and my body must be a blessing to all who come within range of me because all is governed by the spirit which is released in meditation which is touched and consciously realized in meditation without this experience in meditation uh, we are living really uh, on words and thoughts on that which is not the real power it is only when the actual experience of meditation comes the actual release of the spirit that I live yet not I is no longer a quotation it is lived or uh, the one which has been so prominent in my experience these last few weeks thy grace is my sufficiency in all things and there is a sufficiency of thy grace ever present with which to meet the need of this moment well now, you know this statement isn't true at all if you look out in the world it isn't true at all look at all the people who are sick and sinning and dying and in prison and in everything else and you say why that makes a liar out of this quotation yes it does but actually I never meant that the quotation would make us free I meant thy grace would be my sufficiency not the quotation the quotation is only to tell me that if I attain thy grace the sufficiency is here that is why there are many many people who do not believe in the Bible because there are so many wonderful Bible promises and they're not true out in the world they just are not true God is an ever-present help and then people get in trouble and God isn't there the Bible lies Ah, but they were depending on a quotation, not on God. They didn't have God, they had a quotation. And they thought that a quotation was God. They thought you could recite uh, the 91st Psalm. None of these evils will come nigh my dwelling place. And lo and behold, the next day they did. Well, the Bible's all wrong. No, they forgot the first sentence. 
He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. He is the only one to whom the evils do not come. In other words, the Bible has been trying to reveal to us that religion is an experience, not a book full of promises. And the world has been living on a book full of promises instead of the experience. You go to communion service, and you take a sip of wine, and you eat a piece of bread, and you say, I've communed with Christ. Maybe up in your mind you have, in your imagination. The communion is an actual experience that takes place within when you come face to face with the Master. When the Master speaks or imparts himself in some way or other, this is communion. Of course, the church service of communion is actually symbolic of the real thing. But it is taken as if it were the real thing, and it cannot be. Because nobody can give you a communion until you and the Christ meet within. That's communion. Right? So it is, then, that we have been led to believe that Jesus' crucifixion saves us from all the punishment for our sins. In other words, when we're born, we should get a certificate saying, sin all you like because Jesus was crucified and uh, we hereby give you a license to enjoy life. But you know this isn't true. And yet, symbolically it's true because when Christ is risen in you, from the tomb where you have Christ buried in you, your sins are forgiven you, and from then on there are no more sins. Because he always accompanies his forgiving with the words, but go and sin no more, lest something worse happen. And you never quite forget that, because it comes with a sharp voice. You say, I thought you were so gentle. Well, not when I say that part of the sentence. I'm gentle when I say, thy sins be forgiven thee. But the other part, I, you know, I remember the sins of the Hebrews. Now, everything in the Bible is truth when it is experienced. You can have Pharaoh at the back of your neck and the Red Sea in front of you, and you can come out without even the smell of smoke, if you have the experience, not just by reading the Bible and quoting it or memorizing it. So it is that our infinite way, unfoldment, revelation, had its beginning with this, there is no God in this world until you experience God. There is no Christ in this world until you experience Christ. And therefore, anything and everything can happen to this world because it is living as a branch of a tree that is cut off. But nothing can happen after we begin the experience of surrendering our lives to this inner spirit and then under the guidance, direction, and protection of the Spirit, performing anything and everything in the outer world that we may be called to. And there may be those who will be nurses, and those who will be doctors, and those who will be lawyers, or those who will be anything and everything. But as long as the work is performed under the grace of God, it must be harmonious, successful, fruitful, abundant, and always with 12 baskets full left over to share with those who have not yet awakened to the experience. Then let us remember 
the meaning, not only of the infinite way, but I know that this is true, the meaning of all true religion is the experience. Whether in Buddhism you experience the Buddha or the Buddha mind, or whether in Christianity you experience Christ or the Christ mind, it's the same thing. It means the fourth dimensional, the Spirit of God, the consciousness of God, the presence of God. <clears throat> You do see, I hope, that every one of you on this path is really seeking to have God so govern his body that he'll always be healthy and young and strong and with vital uh, faculties. Everyone on this path has to admit that that's their hope, their dream. But I'm afraid that too few remember that this cannot be until you also surrender your mind to that same spirit. Because you cannot have your mind run loose in one way and have your body governed another way because God's government is through the mind and the body. We receive the realization of God probably through our unconditioned mind, through the mind when it is not thinking personal thoughts or selfish thoughts or evil thoughts. And in receiving God in the mind, it becomes the harmony of the body because mind is the substance of the body. And therefore, when the mind is full of God, the body is full of harmony. Now this is also according to scripture, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Lean not unto thine own understanding, acknowledge him in all thy ways. Well, you've got to acknowledge him in your mind as well as in your body. And if you do want God government of the body, remember it has to come through the mind. Then you must accept God government of the mind. Therefore, you must be willing when you go into meditation to receive God in your mind and not expect God is going to do something to your body without getting through your mind. That just is not going to happen. Yes, you have to surrender your business to God. You have to surrender your art, your talent to God because you cannot have God's government in one part of your life and say, but don't touch this one. We have had experiences in the past where we have been asked for treatment for uh, a condition of health and the person would say, uh, but don't treat me for smoking. I want to keep on smoking. Well, if it's up to us to tell God what you'd like, I'll be very glad to deliver a message. Whether he'll perform, that I, I can't be sure. He sometimes doesn't listen to me. Do you see how that is? That when you go to God, it is only in a complete surrender. And a complete surrender doesn't really mean uh, making yourself nothing or making yourself an automaton or anything of that kind. It really means surrendering yourself to the influence of purity, of harmony, of grace, of in every department of life, and not saying, I want to save out this department for myself. Because that, th there, there is the barrier for many. They want a religious life, but then when they go to business, if uh, they have to cheat a little bit or do a little false advertising, well, they don't want God to look in on that department. But actually, it, it doesn't work. 
it doesn't work. And that is the reason for so much failure. You see? That, that we are holding out an area in which we really don't want God to butt in. Okay? Give me my health. Ah, oh, yes. Do that. But please, uh, let me alone over here. I'm having a very, very good time. <laughs> Yes, this brings this up then. I suppose this is the subject of forgiving or praying for the enemies. In surrendering ourselves to the spirit within, since God does not function on a personal basis, God won't do anything for me personally. There must be within me always the remembrance that this that I seek, I seek for all mankind, for everyone, friend or enemy. Because it would be as impossible to channel God into me or into you as it would be to channel the rain into my garden. If I want to pray for rain, I better just be praying for rain. And, and not specify my garden. I'll have to be willing for it to fall on the garden of all those I don't like as well as those I do. And so it is that we, when we are realizing this uh, divine presence, we have to include world work in that. We must include the fact that let thy grace be upon all mankind. Let all men be receptive to thy presence. Whether or not they are is not the point. The point is that we are surrendering personal interest in the desire of, in, in the act of loving our neighbor as ourself. There's no way to love our neighbor as ourself in a quotation. We can only love our neighbor as ourself in praying for ourselves. And then including the neighbor, friendly neighbor, enemy neighbor, in the prayer. In other words, we have to realize the universal nature of God's grace. And never believe that it can be channeled to good people only, or to uh, white Protestants over 21. <clears throat> it doesn't function that way. God's grace is universal. And... Uh, to love our neighbor as ourself means that when we do have this gut contact, let us pray that it touches all mankind. You see, then we're surrendering all personal self-interest. We're praying a right. Now notice this difference, I have to emphasize this because I think this is the first time in the entire history of the Infinite Way work that we have brought in the subject of surrendering ourselves to God, mind and body. In other words, desiring health but desiring also the purity of mind. And do not forget this part of it, that in this, you are not choosing right thinking over wrong thinking or pure thinking over impure thinking, that you are opening yourself really only to spiritual thinking. That is, to whatever flows forth from the kingdom, the consciousness within you. And so remember that all that we have said today means that when you go within, you're going within your own consciousness because that is where you live. That is the sanctuary of your being, your consciousness. As a matter of fact, it isn't your consciousness. It is the consciousness which you are. 
you are consciousness and you go within to that consciousness which you are and out of the consciousness which you are flows spiritual grace. Thank you.